when I think of Dr. Ridley, I think of a man who was modest, but a man with such an inspirational presence. He was a wonderful combination of high intellectualism and Virginia gentleman personality embodied in a black man. He was a very principled person. He wasn't going to silently accept injustice. He wasn't going to do it. It took a special man to be that first, a special person to be that first. Without him, where would others of us be? Thomas Jefferson founded the University of Virginia as a public institution of learning for all people. But this vision was unfulfilled. Ignorance and bigotry prevented blacks from being educated within these buildings that their ancestors had helped to construct brick by brick. The university in 1951 was well over 125 years old. Its undergraduate community was nearly all male. The entire faculty and student populations were white, with no exceptions. Yet it would be a black man, a native son of the state, who would change the course of history at the University of Virginia. Walter Nathaniel Ridley was born on April 1, 1910, in Newport News, Virginia. His family had come from Durham, North Carolina, and prospered in this waterfront town. His father, John Ridley, became head steward at the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company and later co-founded the Crown Savings Bank. His mother, Mary, taught piano as the couple raised their eight children. Education was foremost in the Ridley household, and Walter proved a good student from his days as a youth through his graduation from Huntington High School in 1927. As a black Virginian, however, his options for continuing his education in his home state were limited. Ridley chose to attend Howard University in Washington, D.C., and quickly found himself among many of the most influential black professors and students of the time. He received bachelor and master's degrees in psychology in 1931 and 1933, graduating with honors. Armed with his firm belief that education was the key to unlocking an individual's full potential, Walter Ridley joined the faculty of Virginia State College as a psychology professor in 1936. As a scholar, Ridley would begin to contemplate doctoral studies. The University of Virginia, though, was the only institution in the state offering doctoral degrees and did not accept black students. But challenges to separate but equal here at the university started before Ridley even began his teaching career. In 1935, Alice Jackson, a black woman, applied for admission to the graduate school. The university denied her application, citing state laws and other good reasons that were never disclosed to her. After her rejection, Jackson wrote this spirited reply questioning the term good and sufficient reasons, and it wasn't long before other black Virginians set their eyes on the university. Ridley saw access to the university as an opportunity to advance his professional career and to improve life for his family. I don't know of any reason why I should not attend the University of Virginia, Ridley would state. My father paid taxes which fund the university. The university did not see matters in the same light. Ridley, an accomplished man who would soon chair Virginia State's psychology department, applied several times over the next decade. He was rejected each time without consideration. 
Under separate but equal, the state of Virginia will pay for Walter Ridley's doctorate studies at the University of Minnesota. The psychology professor commuted to school each summer, making the long drive from his home in Petersburg to his studies in Minneapolis. Ridley embarked on a thesis aimed at identifying how racial and cultural prejudices in film impacted the education of black students. As he poured through reel after reel, his eyesight began to deteriorate. Doctors told him to stop his work, and Ridley found himself back in Virginia without his degree. But his experience in Minnesota had its silver lining. There, Ridley met St. Paul native Henrietta E. Bonaparte, and the two were wed in July of 1939. The couple became parents of two children, a daughter, Yolanda, and a son, Don. More than fatherhood would keep Ridley busy during the 1940s. In addition to growing the psychology department at Virginia State, he was a dedicated leader of state and national black teaching organizations. For Ridley, though, the decade's most important event may have taken place at the University of Virginia when President Colgate Darden recruited Lindley Stiles to become the new dean at the Curry School of Education. And he said, Dr. Stiles, if you come here and be my dean and help make this a real state university out of, out of this, a university for all the people, I won't make you any little promises, but I'll make you one big one. Whatever you ask me to do, whether I understand you or whether I agree with you, I'll do it. And he kept his word. But I think there were times that he gulped a little bit when he found out what his promise led to. Stiles planned to recruit qualified black students to the Curry School, an idea university officials hoped would help offset a rising number of lawsuits in which black applicants were challenging the rule of separate but equal. In July of 1950, Gregory Swanson won admission to the law school at the University of Virginia through a court challenge, making him the first black student to attend the university. Not only was his lawsuit successful, but the court ordered the university to pay his legal fees as well. And so the university officials are very concerned about that. Swanson left the university after a difficult year at the law school, but word was out that Dean Stiles and the Curry School were opening their doors to black students. The first person who came was Walter Ridley. He said something I'll never forget. He said, Dr. Stiles, my people think you're putting your career on the line for us, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Well, that's how it started. In September of 1951, Almost three years before the Brown decision ordering the desegregation of public schools, Walter Ridley was a student at the University of Virginia. In your fourth year, you may be one of the privileged students who live here on the lawn. In these rooms from the days of Thomas Jefferson, university students have enjoyed the simple life. Each room has its own fireplace its old mantles, its feeling of closeness with the past. Life at the University of Virginia in 1951 mirrored the relatively peaceful post-war period of American life. But the university, the city of Charlottesville, and the state of Virginia were still a part of the American South, where Jim Crow laws, racial hatred, and increasing violence made for dangerous times for black Americans. It was into this climate that Walter Ridley started his journey. Ridley was uniquely qualified to deal with the demands of being the first black student at the university. At 41 years old, he was more a peer of his teachers than his fellow students. A mature, accomplished man, Ridley's sole focus was working hard and earning his degree. As he commuted from his home in Petersburg for his classes, he was spared the potentially difficult task of living on grounds. Still, Ridley's circumstances made for some tense moments. He had to take a statistics class. It was required, though he had taken lots of statistics classes before, and in fact, he taught statistics. 
one of his professors had asked him to come up in front of the class and demonstrate something on the, the board in front of the class. And as he was working, he, know, he felt some eyes on him. And he couldn't make out who they were. But he now was teaching this point and was frightened about who these people were. But he continued to work and wasn't sure what he would see when he came outside of the, the building. So he finished teaching. He was congratulated by the professor of, on doing a good job. And the class then ended. Students begin to file out. Dad decides that he will let the classroom empty and he's gonna be the last one to go out. He decides not to say anything to anybody about what he's worried about. As he walks out, he finds that there are the janitorial staff, African-American workers from the university who have come to see Mr. Ridley who is the student here. And as he walked out, they parted, and they said to Dad, oh, Mr. Ridley, we're so glad you're here. Yeah. The challenges of being the first black student did not keep Walter Ridley from becoming an exemplary honor student. He received the grade of A in all of his courses, except for one B plus, and became the first black student initiated into a university honorary society. On June 15, 1953, Ridley stood poised to receive his Doctorate of Education from the University of Virginia, making him not only the school's first black graduate, but the first black to receive an academic doctoral degree from a traditional Southern white college or university. And it was a glorious June, Virginia day. And I remember my mother's sense of happiness and pride. I remember there being photographers, um, and I remember there being applause when Dad was handed his degree. It was just a peaceful, beautiful, fulfilled day. As for Ridley himself, he would choose to emphasize the positives of his time at the university. If anyone gave any sign that I was not welcome, he would later state, I was not conscious of it. Grandson of slaves, husband and father, educator, Dr. Walter Ridley had made history. Now it would be seen if his achievement was the ending of a personal tale or the start of a much bigger story. A small number of black students followed Ridley at the university in the 1950s. Younger and more absorbed into life on grounds, these men would struggle to make their way in a segregated world. In 1955, a year after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, three men made history by desegregating the University of Virginia's undergraduate community. Enrolling in the engineering program, were George Harris, Theodore Thomas, and Robert Bland. Well, the reason I wanted to come was just because somebody said I couldn't. <laughs> and so um, I wanted to, to test the system. I knew that, that there, we had had this recent Supreme Court decision, and so my first inclination was, well, let's try and see what happens. Bland, Harris, and Thomas were alienated from their classmates. Three men studied together, ate together, and lived together. Bland and Harris were roommates, and Thomas was right down the hall from them in his own single. The three men found their coursework and campus life difficult to manage. At the end of the first year, Harris and Thomas were to withdraw from Virginia and transfer to other universities. Bland stayed. Well, I, I didn't know I was going to make it, <laughs> but, but I d was determined I wasn't going to quit either. You know, I was either going to make it or flunk out or <laughs> whatever. They would put me out, but I, I wasn't going to quit and, and leave, and that was just a decision that I had made, that I was going to see it through, whatever it brought, you know, success or failure. 
Also arriving at the university in 1955 was John Merchant, who followed in Gregory Swanson's footsteps and entered the law school. Like Swanson's before him, it would not be an easy journey. I came here in September 55, one year after Brown versus Board of Education was decided by the Supreme Court. And as I recall, Governor Battle was leading the South in a, something called massive resistance to Brown. And so the climate was very much uh, a scary one. I didn't expect that I would finish the University of Virginia during those times. And I thought that the role I would play as other blacks across the nation were doing as a part of, and this was before the civil rights struggle, that I would come here and go as far as I could. It's the second year, maybe the third year or something. I would go as far as I could, and I would at least pave the way for other blacks that would come. During the 1950s, there were no more than 10 black students attending the university at any one time. With no roadmap to follow, these young men turned not only to each other for support, but to the black community in Charlottesville as well. The situation was comparable to being in the service. Said um, the men were actually in combat, you know, when they're in war, they're actually in combat, and then they have a reprieve and go behind the line. So the university was like the combat zone for them, and then they had a free time to come down and relax. Community was what black people knew. I mean, it was a way of survival. So to extend that courtesy to the students at the university was a part of who we were and what we knew. In 1958, John Merchant became the first black graduate of the law school. The following year, Robert Bland would fulfill the promise he made to himself by becoming the first black undergraduate to take his degree from the university. Jim Trice would follow with the honor of being the first black student to earn a degree in chemical engineering. But 10 years after Walter Ridley was admitted to the University of Virginia, there seemed little chance the administration would work to increase the black student population or lead the university from its segregationist course. From editorials in the Cavalier Daily to their treatment of black students and their white supporters, it was clear many students and faculty joined administrators in remaining firmly opposed to integrating the university. I think in the end, all of them wound up looking foolish because the African-American students were so much more prepared intellectually and prepared in terms of moral fiber. They were stronger uh, than these people who tried to create this hostile climate. Though small in numbers, black students at the university were becoming vocal leaders for change. Men such as Virginius Thornton, Wesley Harris, and Raymond Gavins were outspoken advocates for racial equality on grounds and in the city of Charlottesville. Black students working for change were bolstered by a visit to Old Cabell Hall by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963 and by 300 students walking the lawn at the Sympathy for Selma March in 1965. While fewer than 20 black students attended the university that year, change was forthcoming. The students who came after 65 were the students who had seen the civil rights movement on television, the beatings, the brutality, and on the part of the black students, the courage, the idealism. When they got here, these white students, they were surprised. Why weren't there more stu black students at the University of Virginia? It had been 10 years since the Brown decision, and there was still a system of tokenism. This just seemed ridiculous. And so they too began to enter the movement for change. And by the end of the 60s, I think they knew their time had come.
The pioneers of the 50s and 60s that had struggled in small numbers could be proud to know that their sacrifices led to an era of administration and students working together to make the University of Virginia a more welcoming home for black students. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, the number of black students rose, the opportunities rose, and expectations rose. But there was often too little connection between black graduates of all generations and their university. Here's a new population who may not have had a good experience here, but we know have a, a fond affection for the institution. How do we get those back? How do we make it work? And so when Mike came to me, it, it seemed like a perfect opportunity for us to do that. Glenn Key, who's now on the Board of Visitors, and I and started brainstorming about having a black alumni reunion. Uh, it, it hadn't been done before. The thing that surprised and shocked me was the resistance initially. Um, I had not originally anticipated the amount of resistance from the early graduates, um, in this, mainly because they had no one had really reached out to them at that scale before, so I think they were skeptical. We decided we would call the first reunion in 1987 the Reunion of Excellence. We'd pay tribute to the first black graduates of the University of Virginia. As plans for the reunion progressed, several organizers received a call from one, Dr. Walter Ridley, who politely informed them that he was the first black graduate of the University of Virginia. The upcoming event represented the first time in 34 years that Ridley, now 77 years old, had been invited back to his university. We were in Gilmer Hall. The auditorium was packed. As master of ceremonies, I decided one of the things that I would do would be to introduce the black graduates through 1969. Jim Trice came up to the podium, welcomed everyone, and said, we're going to do a roll call. And that roll call is going to start with the first black graduate of the university. 1953, the first black graduate, Walter Ridley. As I watched him move up to the front to receive the honor of being the first black to graduate, it seems to me I saw his body even straighten up. I saw his steps with a little bit more spirit in it. And I looked at his wife, and she had this great smile of satisfaction on her face. And I said to myself, wow. One by one, the first black students to attend the University of Virginia were called forth to take their place beside Dr. Ridley. It was chilling, I still remember it. It was chilling both for the audience and for those graduates who I think had not quite been honored that way before. Honoring the early graduates was an inspirational moment. But perhaps more important, the day produced an equally inspired idea. It was a, a break in the ceremonies on that Saturday. And John Merchant approached Harold Marsh, Harold Marsh and me. And he said, you know, I got an idea that I want to run past you guys. And I, you know, we chatted, I, I told him what I was, wanted to do with respect to uh, challenging them to create a fund that we paid into to help other blacks. I mean, we know they need it. We just got through needing it ourselves. In short order, a black scholarship fund was formed, complete with a board of directors and the humble total of $3,300. In choosing a name for the fund, there was little question what needed to be done. It was agreed that I would call Ridley and ask his permission to use his name. And I did. And uh, the man shed tears on the phone. I shed them with him. I'm not ashamed. Uh, when he agreed to let us use his name, 
It is very apt that uh, we have named our scholarship after Walter Ridley because he, he was a superb educator who was himself a college president and who had been very active uh, in, in, in the life of higher education and higher education in the South uh, for uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, Dr. Ridley himself was, was the model of, of selfless attention to uh, student well-being, student rights, extraordinary man sweet-tempered, intellectually hard-minded, sharp, sharp man, with a tremendous amount of dignity and compassion. And the courage that it took to be the first African-American student at the university, um, I think that that is such an incredible, incredible contribution for the ongoing generations that he really deserves to have this scholarship fund named after him and he was proud to come back and interact on an annual basis with, with, with a bit of his legacy to see, you know, the kinds of students that were here that were, you know, didn't have to fight the same fight that he did to be here um, and the accomplishments that they were making. He really was proud, you know, sort of considered this, the current students and the alums as, as, as children as part of his legacy. The Walter N. Ridley Scholarship Fund, now known simply as Ridley, not only awards scholarships for black students, but also provides a black alumni institution that mentors students, maintains alumni connections at the university, and guarantees a black presence here at the University of Virginia. Heading into its third decade, Ridley continues to grow. Ridley Fund is becoming quite, scholarship fund is becoming quite successful. Why? You know, I think it is as simple as People recognize that it's an idea whose time has come. To me, it was like, you know, we've suffered through an awful lot, and now we have a chance to do something. Ridley is a fund that was started in 1987 uh, under the guidance of John Merchant with the intent of being an alumni-based group that would raise scholarship monies to go to bringing in uh, the best African-American students to the university. It's a, a scholarship that offers merit scholarships to, to uh, incoming um, black students. And because of that, it allows us to compete for the best and brightest students across the country. We live by and sort of die by the fact that we are the number one major public university and we want to continue in that vein. And we feel that Ridley is a lever and a catalyst in doing so. When you think about what the history of this institution was and the extraordinary resistance to bringing people of color in, I think really illustrates how far we've come, how much we have uh, now uh, given our attention to recognizing talent and recognizing the capability of individuals to add something worthwhile to the environment and seeking them out and maintaining them at the institution as a way to uh, help uh, our students get the best possible education that they can. And so through this Walter and Ridley Scholarship Fund, we're able to provide students with assistance to come here and to make differences at UVA. And I believe the alumni who have actively been a part of Ridley believe in it. And so it's not just uh, donate a check and, and walk away from it. I think everybody actively participates in it and actually participates in the school and thinks it'll make it better. We may not have the largest cohort of alumni, but I dare say we may have one of the most committed uh, cohorts of alumni at this institution. And they give back in ways that um, are meaningful. Um, money, time, talent, um, and their commitment to excellence. I see through the students, I see through the Ridley Scholar alums, I see through board members, I see through the networking with other alums, I see through dealing with the university and having a seat at the table now that uh, we have, uh, we're sitting on a precipice of something really great here and it just has to continue. More than 11,000 black students have followed Dr. Walter Ridley through the University of Virginia, each drawing strength and support from those who have come before them, each strengthening the foundation for those who will follow.